Peters. Welcome to another episode on the criminal calendar. We have a guest today who will sound as though she came from a huge distance, but she actually now <laughs> lives in California. Welcome, Reese Bowen. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's the Welsh accent. <laughs> oh, the Welsh, yeah, indeed, too goodness. I can mm. do the real Welsh accent if you like, but no, no, it's the British accent anyway, but it um, doesn't, well, doesn't go away. I've lived here 30 years and okay. I still sound the same. Are you from Britain or from Wales? I'm actually, I was born on, in Bath, which is the wrong side of the Bristol Channel, according to the Welsh. Um, but my mother's family lived in Wales. So I spent a lot of time with relatives in the north of Wales um, when I, I was growing up. Yeah. I thought you must have, because you're yeah. one of the few people I know who can gargle that double Oh, L. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you say the ladies of Llangollen? Llangollen, yes. See, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just spit yeah. at you and be yeah. totally rude. Yeah. Well, that <laughs> longest name in Wales, you know, the Llanfair, Pulgwingil, Gugarinquid, the Robbwyl, Llanty, Silio, Gugugoch. No. <laughs> I don't know. That's actually a station name in Wales. That it just you just it all means something. You just add on, you know, the church of the hollow and the white hazel and the rapid whirlpool and all these things. So, so this is really the Cymric, a language that yeah. at one point was in danger of dying out, wasn't it? And it's actually growing now, which is very interesting. Um, by 1900, I think there were there were very few Welsh speakers, and it got less and less as the old people died. And the, actually, the English punished you in school for speaking Welsh. Right. And um, so it got to the stage where really the, only the old people would speak it. The young people would understand it and go, yeah, yeah, in English. Um, and then in the 60s, I think, there was a really nationalistic upswing again and a national pride. And they started teaching Welsh in the schools again. And now it's a compulsory language till the age of 11. And from 11 onwards, you have a choice of going to a Welsh senior school or an English senior school. So you actually can do your entire education in Welsh if you want to. But are, are most people, in fact, bilingual? Um, in the north, I would say almost everybody's bilingual. In the south, it's less than bilingual. There, there are people who learned it in school and promptly forgot it. And um, it used to be, I was in Swansea about a month ago. Swansea used to be quite a big Welsh-speaking city. I couldn't find a single person who spoke Welsh there. And the funny thing is they all speak with the Welsh accent. They all say, you know, are you going to have that for your breakfast? And then I'd say something to them in Welsh, and they'd go, I'm sorry, I don't speak any Welsh. So um, that's rather strange. So they have the rhythm they, have they the, don't they, have, they have, the have vocabulary. They speak English as if they spoke Welsh as their first language, which they don't. But in the north, many people have Welsh as their first language, and most other people understand it. And today, if you want to work in any sort of government, if you want to be a librarian, social worker, etc., you have to be bilingual. So there's a huge rush to adult education courses to um, brush up on your Welsh. What, um, what's the role of the church in Wales? Is it the Anglican Church? Or? Um, there is the Church of Wales, which is the Anglican Church in Wales. But really, the strength is in the chapels. Right. Um, most people in Wales were nonconformist. You know, the, the huge Wesleyan movement that really appealed to the miners and all the, all the sort of manual workers and the chapel became the center of their social life. And um, uh, you know, the only place they were allowed to sing with that sort of worship was in chapel. So you had this wonderful singing and the, the male voice choirs. Uh, so the, the chapel probably has more strength than the, than the Church of Wales. But both are really dwindling now. When I was a child, you could have one village with eight chapels along one street. And uh, which chapel do you go to? Well, I go to Beulah. Well, I go to Emmanuel, you know. Um, now you'll find most of those have become hairdressing salons and um, new age centers and God knows what, because uh, there are very few people who go to chapel anymore. Well, it figures into your books, yeah, which we yeah, will, we will yeah, get to, the yeah. ones set in the Welsh village. Also, it seems to me the Simric, it must encourage a sort of innate musicality of the Welsh. I think, what, what do they say? The Welsh are born with, um, they're not born with a su silver spoon in their mouth, but with music in their heart and a song on their lips or something like that. Yes. Well, you take um, advantage of that again in yeah, the plot of, yeah. of Evanly Choirs. But just people in Wales really, singing is a part of their life. And I think the Welsh voice is designed for singing. You have very, a lot of very famous Welsh singers, of course, like Bryn Tevil and Charlotte Church now. And, um, but the normal people, you go to a chapel and they've got a hymnal, they will sing it in four parts, just perfectly naturally. You know, I'm singing the baritone. and. Um, most people there can read music, know how to sing in parts, and it's just part of their life. It's, um, it's wonderful. 
Well, your, yeah. your fondness for the language yeah. and all those yeah. rhythms certainly comes up in your Welsh Constable book about Evan mm -hmm. Evans. Mm -hmm. But um, let's digress for a minute. This is a very exciting spring for you. Tell me what yeah. all awards you have been nominated for. Well, it's for the, for the other book, which has nothing to do with Wales, but it takes place in New York in 1901, features a feisty Irish he heroine called Molly Murphy, and so far it's been nominated for the Mary Higgins Clark Award, which is part of the Edgars, and for the Agatha Award for Best Novel, and then for Romantic Times Reviewer's Choice Best Historical. So that's yeah, very nice. So that far. is yeah, exciting. Yeah. That is, in fact, the book mm. on our left there yeah. called Murphy's Law. Um, mm. tell, me about, um, tell me about the conception of Murphy's Law. It was a departure for you. Well, I like doing the Constable Evans books. I think they're fun, and I like all the characters, but they take place in a a small part of Wales. There are certain crimes that will never happen there. And also because Constable Evans is a very polite, nice chap. He doesn't lose his temper. He takes it on the chin when his superiors are rude to him. And I had an itching to do, first of all, a female protagonist. I thought it would be nice to do a female protagonist, first person voice. And I thought I wanted to do someone who was a little um, feistier than Evan who doesn't always take it on the chin, who is polite, who's not always polite to people, who doesn't always know when to shut up when it's good for her to shut up. You know, someone who's a little more like me, who has been known to stand in the quick check line and go, one, two, three, four, oh, excuse me, you have 10 items there, you know. Um, that's so British. You guys are much more forthright in your <laughs> everyday. I mean, truly, really, I've, I've often remarked that when I read uh, British books or uh, go to England, that you guys are much more uh, blunt and in dealing, you know, in with some other ways, people. But, you know, in and other more, ways. And more reserved and, and polite yeah. in others. In some ways, British take abysmal service much more than Americans do. You know, if you watch Forty Towers, when they have this awful service there, and the food is just disgusting, and uh, Basil Fawlty will come up to these old ladies and say, how is everything? And they go, oh, very nice, thank you. Um, but that's about not complaining, and that's different than when somebody's breaking the rules. I think what often inspires yeah. this more mm -hmm. brutal approach that Americans might take is that, um, you know, there's, there's a much greater emphasis on order, yeah. keeping your place, yes. standing in the queue. Yes, standing in the queue. Right. Yes, yeah. um, and, um, and people who try to muscle around, yes, you know, these kind yeah. of social norms get very short shrift. Yes, I think yeah, the British have a strong sense of justice and a strong sense of what is done and what's not done, you know. This is done, that's not done. Absolutely mm -hmm. true. So it's interesting that your character, Molly Murphy, is in fact somebody who comes to America mm -hmm. on the wrong side mm -hmm. of the law. Yeah. Because she's Irish anyway, yeah, right? Yeah, she's Irish anyway, mm -hmm. yes. She's a feisty Irish woman, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of Celt, so I can, I can identify with that. We're, we're all feisty. We, uh, well, what is it that um, has propelled Molly away from the old sod at the, and um, we're back what, at the, we're in Ellis Island, so it's yes. back um, right at the... 1901. Right, turn yeah. of, the, of the 20th. Yeah. You know, it's terrible now to have to say the turn, turn of the, the 20th century. century. Yes, yes. Yeah. I find yeah. myself going, yeah. oops, yeah. wrong century. Well, you know, in about 10 years' time, when this generation has grown up, and you say, well, I remember that was the early days of the century, they're, they're going to say, you know, that was your century, Grandma, you know, that's not... I'm what? hoping the term fantasiac, which I'm very fond yeah, of, yeah. you know, end of century in yeah. French, will forever mean yes. uh, the, that, that Edwardian that, area. Yes, yeah. And yeah. so I'm, I'm finding yeah. myself saying mm. fantasiac rather yeah, than fan, turn of the century. Yeah. Fan de la siècle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. yes. Well, Molly has escaped from Ireland because she's had to run away because she's inadvertently killed someone. Um, um, Not by design, but no. from force of circumstance. Yeah, a, a, man, a man has tried, to, the landowner's son has tried to rape her, and she has forcefully defended herself, and he has hit his head on her stove, and is lying dead on her kitchen floor, as the book opens. That was a debate, you know, when do you come into a story like that? Do we show that scene, or we, do we come in when that scene's already happened? And refer back? Yeah, and I decided this was nothing to do, apart from s propelling her from Ireland, it was nothing to do with her current story, so I came in after it. And so she flees to England, and she has just about enough money that she's taken from her father's teapot on the mantelpiece to get her to England, and then she doesn't know what she's going to do. She fully expects to be caught. Well, she's assuming um, that any story she might give of yeah. self-defense yeah. is not going to be... She's a, well, she's a peasant. She's on his estate, and he's the landowner's son. So she's assuming there will be no, no justice. So she just flees 